Good afternoon and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, Pacific Partnerships in Education is the show today. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about a recently completed event, the Micronesian Youth Summit, uh, an annual event. And here are uh, two folks to talk with us about it, Caroline Carl and Austin Lip. Hey, if I got that right, uh, <laughs> almost. Um, both UH students, I guess, both sort of affiliated with We Are Oceania in various ways, uh, and both very much involved with the, the Micronesian Youth Summit that just completed last week, basically. So uh, tell me briefly about, about sort of what this is, because I suspect a lot of our viewers don't actually know what the Micronesian Youth Summit is. Well, the Micronesian Youth Summit is basically kind of like an annual thing that got started two years ago. And it's more of a, just a way we can bring the Micronesian students um, in the high schools and middle schools together to kind of get them college ready and at the same time kind of get them embracing their culture. Okay. Yeah. And so it's, it's meant as sort of a celebration, uh, a chance to uh, network with one another, mm -hmm. see some role models, get some encouragement, mm -hmm. right. all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, and about how many students were, were there? This year, I want to say about close to 300, 350. Uh -huh. wow. We had a good turnout. That, that's yeah. quite, quite a quite yeah. right. And they are from all of Micronesia writ large, basically? From the FSM all the way to the Marshall Islands, okay. everywhere in between. Okay, uh, excellent, excellent. And, and how long was this, this all-day event, basically? The registration is from 8.30. It starts at 8.30. Um, and this year, uh, we ended promptly about 4.30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like good. And there, so there are speakers, workshops, various sorts of things. Tell, tell me a little bit about some of those that might have. Might have. Um, a lot of our guests or keynote speakers that we asked to come out are usually representatives of the Micronesian community here in Hawaii. Okay. Um, our breakout sessions consist of either having college students like us on a panel to okay. show the students that um, there are people who look like them, members of their community that are in higher education and that are succeeding in higher education. Um, and then we also have um, panels from um, a lot of the NGOs that work with the Micronesian community here. Um, and like for this year, um, we had a lot of uh, Micronesian professionals. So we had uh, members of, there's a, I forgot the name of a gentleman that came from Matson, but he's from Chuk. Right. And so he delivered, um, a special keynote. They were actually one of the sponsors also, Matson. So just um, key figures like that that they can see that are um, professional Micronesians and they're succeeding, like Carol said. And, um, Excellent. No, that's, that's very important for, for young people to see that they, they can fit in. They, they, there are people from their communities who are actually out there succeeding in this essentially a, a foreign land, you know, mm -hmm. a land very different from where they grew up, particularly if they're from an outer island somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, uh, and one of the key things, and people I think don't always appreciate the, the real profound difference that these students have to deal with. It's not like a normal student going from middle school and high school here mm -hmm. who's been on Oahu and in Honolulu their whole lives, right? A lot of these students are coming in sometimes from these very small islands of 300, 400 people where mm -hmm. they've lived their whole lives and suddenly being dumped into this urban thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, the school systems in the region are, they don't teach English skills right. in the same way that the English isn't spoken really very much other mm -hmm. than in school, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it, they don't give a chance to practice it. They don't uh, use it all the time, so they aren't as facile. So this puts them at a significant disadvantage in school. So again, I, I think it's valuable what, what you do here to mm -hmm. encourage and support. Um, so you also, you highlight, I assume, students who are, I mean, obviously, you're in, you're in college and doing well, so that, that's, that's highlighting that. You also highlight some of their peers in high school and uh, middle school who are making strides there. Um, so we're actually a part of um, a club at UH Manoa. We have okay. our own Micronesian club. It's called uh, Micronesia Connections. Okay. And so um, during these youth summits, we have our own table. Um, this year, Shamanad, their Micronesian club came out. I'm um, just like again for the kids, so they can come and see that you know there are Micronesian students at these kind of universities that are making it, and 
if they go, you know, they'll have a place where they can fit in and feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and it's uh, a growing population certainly, mm -hmm. but, but growing from a very small number is in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Chaminade's now been working on this for some years, really, really specifically focused on places like Chuuk. Mm -hmm. I know they had a cadre of nursing students at one point mm -hmm. from, from Chuuk and worked with them as a, as a tight-knit group, basically, to get them through the program. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the most profound part of uh, the Youth Summit for me is that the people who engage with these students are people who not only show up as Micronesians, but they show out as Micronesian. Mm -hmm. they, um, they make a point of either wearing their traditional attire or speaking in their language when addressing these students. And I hear students who are like, wow, he's in college and he has an accent just like me and he's making it, you know? And for me, I think that's one of the things that these students really look forward to when coming to the youth. Right. I think, I think that kind of role modeling is really critical and, and it's unfortunately fairly rare at this point still. And that's doubly why, why you're why your event is important, and particularly given there is, you know, a lot of people think of Micronesians as being sort of just one group of people, but mm -hmm. it's really a very diverse group. I mean, even I know I, I did work for a while out in Yap, and I know Yap has what four distinct, mutually incomprehensible languages, mm -hmm. and then multiple dialects of each, and that's just Yap, which is sort of, I guess the smallest right. of the four states within the Federated States of Micronesia. Right? There are eighteen or twenty major different languages in the region, or mm -hmm. something. Uh, we're from the same country. Okay. We're from two different states. Okay. And we can't understand each other's language. Right. Uh, we have completely different cultures, uh, completely different languages. Even the outer islands within the main, mm. the, the main islands in the states have their own different cultures and their different languages. So I'm from Yap. Right. The okay. outer islands. And even within Yap state, you know, right. the outer islanders come down to Yap, we, you know, we have to speak English because... That's how different the languages are. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's important even for like the, the kids here, because a lot of them, especially these generations coming up, they've never been back home. Mm -hmm. So this kind of gives them that chance to you know, see outside what they see at home, mm -hmm. see outside of you know, maybe their Marshallese family or their Chukis family. They can see other islands like Palau, Yap. Right. And understand there's, there's yeah, multiple people coming, mm -hmm. going through these same kind of challenges together meeting with them, uh, learning from them, hopefully picking up maybe some kind of a, a mentorship relation. Uh, that, that, that'd be great. Um, does the school system support this in any way? Or is this pretty much you, you guys doing it on your own? So um, I'm a social work major. I know the Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work at Manoa. I know that they uh, played a huge part in securing the venue okay. at UH. Uh, this year was at the campus center mm -hmm. and so the connections that we have over there well the connections that we are oceania has with the school of social work definitely helped because um, i think last year they had them they had the youth summit at east west center mm -hmm. i think it was a good space but i think for that number of kids i think it was just a little bit too small so the campus center was really um i think it played a big role you know Excellent. Yeah, I suspect, I suspect as the word gets out, this thing probably is going to grow each year, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because there, I mean, I don't know that anyone has hard and fast figures, but, but there's, there are certainly big numbers of Micronesian students within the A-12 system here, and mm -hmm. it's got to be getting bigger all, every year, I, I've got to assume, uh, just because of the, there's a steady migration here. So that, that's, that's going to be sort of a... I guess a bittersweet thing for you guys, right? I mean, more of your fellow country folks are showing up here, which is great mm -hmm. on one level, but it means your country's youth are, a lot of them leaving it, and as you say, not, not getting back very much. Right. Um, well, what, do you, what do your parents or relatives from uh, the, the home area tell you about that in terms of what impacts that, that's having? Well, for me, so I grew up here in Hawaii. I okay. went to Lunalilo Elementary School, went to Washington for about a year. And then I moved back to Point Bay. Um, sure. Growing up in Hawaii, I didn't know what it was to be a Micronesian. Like, no one in the school system, because of my good grades, expected me to be a Micronesian. Um, and they would always be surprised when they found out. Oh. Um, <laughs> and then moving back to Point Bay, um, I finally got the idea of uh, who I was, uh, where I came from. Um, and then when I came back 
to Hawaii for university, I realized that for a lot of my community, it's not a choice moving out here. Mm -hmm. um, if I could have gotten my PhD in Puente, I promise you I would have stayed there mm -hmm. to do that. Um, if my uncles or my aunts could have gotten the medical care they need back home, they definitely right. would have stayed home to do it. Um, so as a college student, I understand that I have to come here, finish my education, but I also have to go back because mm -hmm. that's where the development is needed and that's why I'm sent out here to grow. Right. right. So you can bring knowledge and expertise and skills that are all needed back to right. back to point by. Mm -hmm. Because the system that's implemented in my island is a Western system. Right. So the only way to help that system succeed is to come into the Western world and learn how to master that Western system. Right. Much as we all might sort of long for the, the good old days, you can't turn the clock back, mm -hmm. right? Now, ideally, you, you'd like to see the education systems, both here in Hawaii and across Micronesia, mm -hmm. prepare students so well so as they get ready to graduate, they had a choice. And they could say, I'm going to go back and, and live the old style life, mm -hmm. or I'm going to go off and become a rocket scientist, you know, or whatever. Uh, that's, unfortunately, a, a, a too big a challenge for education systems mm -hmm. here and much less uh, across Micronesia. So, um, but it, uh, that's wonderful. And, and I think um, I have a lot of the same experiences. I also grew up in the diaspora. I was okay. born and raised, first generation born U.S. citizen in North Carolina. <laughs> um, and it was, it was nice. We had a Micronesian community out there, so all of us got together. And um, I guess you could say it was as close to back home as I could get, you know, being with my family that was there. And then I guess when I moved over here, it was kind of, Interesting to see the social climate, you know, with um, a lot of the problems, you know, going on, especially with the Micronesians coming in, being the new, the mm -hmm. newest uh, migrant group, migrant population here. And um, so I think as far as uh, my, respons my responsibility back home, I think all of us as Micronesians, we have that sense of responsibility to, you know, at least try and aid back home as, mm -hmm. as much as we can. So, I mean, that could come into a lot of different types of things, like if somebody passes away and we send money, you know, like those kind of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Those are responsibilities that I don't think us as Micronesians, whether growing up here in, in the U.S. or wherever, I don't think we can escape those, those no. kind of things. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting uh, to see the, the strong sense of family and community mm -hmm. that, that, that across Micronesia we've seen uh, among kids, kids who have been offered in some cases chances to come to Hawaii or go to Guam for higher education mm -hmm. at times turn it down because of their family oblig obligations. Mm -hmm. they, they have to stay home and take care of younger siblings or whatever, whatever it may be, um, which is sort of a shame in some ways, but it, it's very admirable too, the, the strong sense of community. I don't think you see nearly that much of it in the broader U.S. community. Yeah. Uh, some, some families are a little more tight-knit than others, but I don't, I don't in general, you, you're going to see that exact same kind of thing. So, um, you were in North Carolina. I spent a little bit of time in North Carolina. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which part? Uh, was it in Chapel Hill? I was in Greenville. That's only an hour and uh -huh. a half south. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, yeah, okay. Um, anyhow, um, so this uh, Micronesian Youth Summit is going to uh, be... Put on again next year? Or are you already starting to plan that? Debriefing from this year? Is... <sighs> yes, so we're definitely going to debrief. Um, we have our venue already locked and secured. Um, hopefully nothing, you know, <laughs> goes <laughs> wrong. Uh, March 7th is uh, the planned date for the next uh, okay. Micronesian Youth Summit. So. I'll tell you what, we're going to maybe explore that a little further when we come back. Right now we're going to take a brief break. Uh, I'm here on Pacific Partnerships in Education talking about the Micronesian Youth Summit with Carol Ann Carl and Alastin Haleapale. I got that wrong again. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we'll be right back after one minute. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour, we're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, 
Just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show. And it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. And welcome back to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for coming back with us. Uh, we're here, I'm here with Caroline Carl and Austin Halayalpe. Hey, closer, there. closer. <laughs> uh, well, we're talking about the 2019 Micronesian Youth Summit, but uh, just as we were finishing up on the previous part of the show, we were, we were looking ahead to the 2020. So let me ask you if there's kids around who want to get involved with this and be a part of it, either as a participant on uh, just as for attending or as they want to offer their themselves as a role model, a participant, more mm -hmm. active role. Do they call you guys? Do they, is there a website they can go to? What's, what's the, the deal? Um, from experience, uh, the people who end up coming to the Youth Summit as kind of spectators. Mm -hmm. um, I remember last year, um, a lot of the spectators were like, hey, can we actually sit on the next panel in the mm -hmm. next session? And so we made that happen. Um, people who come out, usually they end up um, signing up with We Are Oceania on that day to okay. volunteer for the next year. Okay. Um, and so contacting We Are Oceania by email or contacting them by phone. We, have, we also have the... All the information online. Um, where Oceania just revamped their whole website, so Good. they have a, a set like a specific tab just for the youth summit where volunteers. There's a volunteer registration form and um, just an event registration form if they just want to attend. Excellent. You, you can feature a lot of different uh, different aspects in terms of sort of the, the academic areas, language arts, social sciences. All these have, in, of course, my favorite STEM: science, technology, engineering, and math. All of these, of course, have applications and uses, mm -hmm. and uh, it'd be great to get students into all these different pathways, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, if, if I might, uh, what, are, what are you guys majoring in? I'm a biochemistry major. All right, there we go. <laughs> all right. Yourself? I'm a social work major. Oh, okay, all right. Both, both valuable things. Biochemistry is a hot topic these days. Uh, a, lot, a lot of very fascinating stuff going on in that. Yeah. So, um, and next year, you say it's March 7th, or even fixed, and it's going to be at the university again? or It's going to be at the university at the same place, uh, okay. the ballroom, um, that was that third floor? Yes. Mm -hmm. third Campus floor. Center ballroom. Campus Center, yeah. Campus Center. Oh, great. No, I've been to a number of conferences there. It's a nice, a nice space for a conference of several mm -hmm. hundred people. Yeah. Good, good. Um, so, you hinted earlier uh, at the fact that there, there is some tension that comes on, but because as Hawaii seems to be done with every wave of migrants mm. who have entered Hawaii, mm. uh, whoever's sort of the current new entry gets uh, a certain amount of backlash, right. we say. Um, how do the students deal with that? I mean, that's that's got to that's gotta be rough. You can go first. <laughs> I think um, for me that's pretty much uh, the reason why I major in what I major in. Um, from what I've seen, um, a lot of the Micronesian students tend to stick together, mm -hmm. uh, which makes sense. You know, you try to find somebody, you know, like you, and then. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I know. I know that the social climate is very hard, um, especially here. I think. Um, I don't think blame is to be, you know, on either side. I think mm -hmm. it's just a lack of understanding on both. Um, like you said, you know, there's been different waves of immigration, and I feel like each and every wave had their own, you know, problems. And um, we're just the next wave with our sure. problems. So. Hawaii is a wonderful state for bringing people together and exactly. you know, uh, mixing them in. Uh, it's, it's intriguing to me when I first got out here to find that there are these sort of Micronesian enclaves and communities scattered mm -hmm. all over the mainland U.S., though, in Arkansas, you mentioned North Carolina, I know Oregon has some uh, very, various different places where apparently one or two or a few people went Sort of settled there for usually mm -hmm. for work reasons, right? Because mm -hmm. there was plentiful good work. 
I could send money back home and all, and then their cousin comes and their brother-in-law comes, mm -hmm. and uh, next thing you know, yeah, there's 50 or 100 people there, right? And I think that um, a lot of times we forget that that's a natural tendency for descendants of a navigating society. Mm -hmm. We've always been a part of a diaspora, right. whether it's the modern one or the, the ancient one where we just traveled by canoe. And I think that's where a lot of, um, not, the, not just the students, but their parents grapple with the confusion that, oh, as descendants of a navigating society, we understand as islanders, when people come to our island, to our homes, we welcome them because we understand that they're in the diaspora searching for home, searching for help, searching for new beginnings. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to kind of help other people understand that as mm -hmm. descendants of a navigating society, that that's, that's what we do? We, we travel, we find new home, and at the same time, we welcome anyone wherever they come from be, because that's just who we are. Very, very admirable, yes. And that's particularly for low-lying nations like the Marshall Islands and Kiribati down in the Southern Hemisphere. That's a, becoming a more urgent problem all the time, right? Because these places with the rising sea levels are rapidly losing their, their mm -hmm. land, and what land is left rapidly not is being salinated by king mm -hmm. tides and all, and so it's not. Uh, fertile anymore. Um, I know in Kiribati they're actually apparently uh, buying old oil drilling rigs and mm -hmm. anchoring them in some of the lagoons there uh, so that when the islands become uninhabitable people will still have a place to live and they can maintain mm -hmm. at least a, a remnant population there and still claim, claim their land, right? Because that, it actually brings up a very interesting sort of legal question. What happens when your country disappears off the face mm -hmm. of the earth? Yeah. How do you where you still exist and all. And I know they've also uh, worked out some deal with, I think, New Zealand or maybe Fiji to get a fairly big mm -hmm. track Fiji, of land uh, there and, and where they can, again, they can have a, a, a larger community. Mm -hmm. But again, they're, they're faced with the same issues, right? Mm -hmm. all, all the island nations are doing this, so. And it's issues that, like these that the Micronesian Youth Summit also brings to the attention of these students that come mm -hmm. because they have that disconnect and they grow up here. Um, the Youth Summit allows them to come into a space where they learn not just about the importance of their identities, but how those identities are so deeply connected to their islands and the problems that those islands face and why education is an important way to help fix those problems or address them. Right. And I think, um, glad you mentioned identity. I think for most of these kids growing up, especially the ones born and raised here, um, I think they struggle a lot with that, that sense of identity. You know being born here, but like, you know, is this home for them? So mm -hmm. I think the Youth Summit also offers that um, place to kind of claim that identity if they should, you know, so, so choose. No, that's incredibly valuable for them, yeah, for a student who hasn't had direct connection with the islands to, mm -hmm. to build at least some sense of community there. We can see people who, are, who really are from, directly from the islands, are from their same previous homeland or their parents' homeland or what, what it may have been. Um, yeah, yeah, it's got to be. That's got to be valuable in, in helping them establish and, and realize the power. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the things they bring. Mm -hmm. So, do you see uh, a lot of people are very worried about 2022, 2023 when the COFA agreements expire if something doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, from uh, your viewpoint, are, are likely to happen at that point? I, th I think for me, um, I'm not a political science, uh, you know, guru, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think just um, speaking out of my own personal opinion, I think a lot of my Canadians are definitely worried about this, especially uh, the Kofa nations. I think that, especially with this um, administration, you know, um, I feel like you kind of, I feel like you hear both sides of the spectrum. You hear sides of this. The spectrum where they're worried, and then you hear the other side, well, you know, we do have a lot to offer and we are mm -hmm. valuable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that sense of security is kind of somewhere in the community. But, mm -hmm. you know, that sense of, you know, being worried is, you know, always going to be there also. Sure. Um, for me, with the compact, um, the way I understand it is that it's two parts the subsidiary agreement and the tertiary agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and the tertiary agreement is valuable to the U.S. in that it claims us and our oceans as a military strategic zone. Right. 
And the subsidiary agreement is the part that everyone's worried about, where we won't be given aid to continue growing our right. uh, government systems. Um, so I'm worried that we won't get the aid that we need to finish what was promised in the first place. But I'm also not afraid that the compact is going to end. Because, you know, back home, you see literally um, Australia, China, and U.S. trying to build things oh, all yeah. at the same time. Right. You have superpowers within, On the same like, <laughs> you can, like, looking across the street, you see all of these superpowers trying to help us build. So mm -hmm. it tells you that the, we do have value to right. the entire world, right. not just the U.S. Yeah. I know China's uh, yeah. been doing a lot as far as offering scholarships to Micronesian students and bringing them to China. So these are students that are, that are going to be going to China, learning how to speak Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. getting familiar with that. Um, it's culture. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. No, because I was doing some work out in the app for a while. I know China at one point, China had a plan to build a giant 10,000 oh, person yeah, resort, exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. which would have been just was a big, sort of insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at it from my point of view, it would be insane. Uh, they don't have the water to do it. My, my, I was having water exactly. issues there. And, and, yeah, and have the water reserves to support you know, golf courses and things like that. Mm. You know. But um, no, that, that's, that's uh, good. I, I like, like both your input there on, on the COFA issues, and I think it's well, well reasoned, and I, I agree. I think there is, uh, the U.S. is not going to walk away from Micronesia, but so. there are voices here who certainly don't want to continue to give uh, so much aid, mm -hmm. so that's going to have to be worked out, I guess. Um, anyhow, um, let's just review again, just to, to wrap things up, the uh, next year's Micronesian Youth Summit is on March 7th, UH campus, and people who are interested can go to the We Are Oceania website and find a, how to get involved in it, volunteer for it, sign up for it. Yeah, so all, all of that information is going to be on the website. Um, we are oceania.org. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, like I said, they just revamped their whole website, so it's a lot, a lot more user friendly. Um, and there's a lot of other events that we're doing up there. That um, for anybody who's interested, we're always looking for um, volunteers and help. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you coming on and, and highlighting this recently passed event and talking about the you know, options for next year. Uh, Carol Ann, Austin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you'll come back and join us for another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education here on Think Tech Hawaii.